hello, my, my name is uh, Charles Young, um, and uh, uh, I'm from a company called Soldsoft Reply. Um, we're a uh, long-standing BizTalk um, specialist company, an integration specialist company uh, here in the UK. I'm principal consultant working for them, been working there since 2004 on uh, BizTalk-related stuff, and over the last few years on, on Azure development, and uh, as, alongside BizTalk. Um, so, moving on um, very quickly, I've um, been taking a little bit of flack from some of my colleagues yesterday. Um, they were um, uh, rather amused. They were looking at the title of my presentation, which has the word microservices in it. And um, they were sort of coming up to me, two or three people actually during the day, saying, not heard the word microservices yet, Charles, in this conference. Not heard the word microservices yet. So I'm going to say uh, something about microservices. I know John also um, is going to be talking about that a little bit. And just to explain that the reason that we talk about microservices is because there was such an emphasis on this, um, especially as news began to break last year of some of the changes uh, that Microsoft were introducing around app service. And so my contribution really to this conference is to talk a little bit about architecture. Always, always keen to inject a bit of architectural thinking in terms of what we're doing. Um, and to think through this from a microservices perspective, I'll explain more about that, to think about integration from that perspective, some of the trends with integration, um, and just to start to consider what this means on Azure, what this means now with App Service, what this means with BizTalk, uh, and what this means uh, for the future as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about containership as we go through and various bits and pieces. So I just want to really sort of start off by um, pointing out that I am an, an EAI person. I am a BizTalk dinosaur. I am an EAI person. Uh, this is what I do for a living. I do enterprise application integration. And enterprise application integration, alongside other aspects of, of integration, is um, you know, all about making sure that different systems within the organization uh, can really talk to each other, despite the fact they were never designed to do that, despite the fact that they were not designed and no thought generally went into really thinking how they would work alongside in this state of applications and systems and services that tend to grow up within organizations. And EAI, as we all know, is, is about um, basically handling a number of different concerns, adaptation, mediation, transformation, routing, orchestration, I've got up there. Um, uh, as opposed to EDI, uh, I haven't myself done so much EDI, there's some people in the room who are real, real experts in this area, um, business to business uh, kind of thing with all the standards around that and, and data integration, and by that I'm really thinking of sort of extract, transform and load. I definitely belong to the, uh, to the first of those circles in terms of where I'm coming from, so I'm going to take that kind of tack and follow that through. Enterprise application integration then, as I say, is about dealing with a wider state of different systems and services, getting them uh, working together. The typical way in which that has been done um, in the past and for many years, and a model which we all understand and, and which is very tried and tested, is to implement some kind of hub in the center of, of, of your estate, some kind of hub which deals with these mediation and transformation requirements, the routing of messages between different systems, a place where you can hook in additional business logic which doesn't belong to any one of those systems, and a place really where you can, you can start to get rid of the mess that grows up around point-to-point -point integration, have that hub actually dealing much more sensibly with uh, a much smaller number of, of connection points and, and moving parts, dealing dealing with um, uh, ensuring that data can be transformed and messages can flow um, between ERP systems and HR systems and websites and applications and services. We're very used to that and messaging hubs have been around for many, many years. Over the course of the last 15 years or so, we've seen a lot of emphasis on the building of service buses, ESBs. And it's probably just worthwhile for a moment just thinking a little bit about the architecture of ESBs and what they're trying to do. Very often they overlap with integration tools and, and, and uh, products and technologies. Uh, they're doing much the same thing. The basic idea of a service bus is not so much actually really having that sort of um, pipe across the uh, enterprise through which messages flow, which is sometimes the way that ESBs are, are, are defined, 
but really providing a very guarded approach to uh, hosting and managing and providing governance over a range of services across, across uh, the organization. By services, typically we're talking about sort of web service type, type approaches or whatever. Being able to distribute those across an organization, but being able to really kind of, as it were, guard and manage and govern that estate of services. And the provision of common um, functionality, which those services can then exploit, common uh, uh, maybe runtime aspects of that uh, that will deal with a number of uh, concerns which come up again and again. So in, in the SB, the approach generally is to sort of uh, really think of it more like a box around a bunch of services, with some of those services living on the outer edge. Some of those services deal with the integration requirements that we have, because they are the ones that talk to or are talked to by uh, external or external to service bus systems and, and, and applications. Applications. We typically call these on-ramp services, and um, we may have uh, also off-ramp services uh, as well. I'll make more sense of that in just a moment. Talking to um, a, a suite of, as I say, guarded and governed distributed services that live on the bus. We can redraw, redraw that diagram, think that diagram through architecturally, um, just putting it into, into a, a circle, perhaps. So we're beginning to draw a connection between that and hubs. Um, again, thinking of our services, some living on the outside, those on and off ramps, some of those living on the inside where we, we govern and manage those. And you can see that it's very natural, therefore, for ESBs to overlap with what integration products do. Uh, they sit there and they have to deal with integration requirements as well. And they live, as it were, in the center of all of that estate of, of applications and systems and services. Okay, so fantastic. Remember to do the animations, Charles. There we go. Um, fantastic. Before I sort of lead off to where I'm really getting to in terms of architecture, let me also just bring up what I'm most familiar with from an architectural point of view. This is the way that since the 1990s, uh, uh, I and, and most of us in the room, I'm sure, have been thinking about architecture and the way in which we design and implement our applications. And we think of this in terms of layered architecture. I, I've got three tiers there, sort of typical textbook kind of approach, presentation, business logic, and data integration. They're very various variations on a theme, um, but essentially led architecture where we, um, as it were, break up these concerns in, in this kind of way into a led uh, fashion. Uh, our presentation layer um, is obviously servicing websites, uh, 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 websites and other channels perhaps into our estate. Um, our data, integra data and integration layer is dealing at the back end perhaps with ERP systems and HR systems and finance systems and databases that we've got and all kinds of stuff that we're doing perhaps with external integration with, with customers and partners. And in the middle we have our application domain, our business logic. Um, which is where we really have you know, the, the stuff we invest in to um, uh, basically encode aspects of the way our organizations work and allow that logic to be reused um, across the tiers. The point about this is that um, there is actually a great deal to be said about the boundary that surrounds that, that middle tier, that business logic tier. That boundary is a really important boundary. And things go really badly wrong, as we know from an architectural point of view, when we allow stuff to, as it were, bleed over that boundary. When, for example, we allow core business logic to end up in the wrong tier, and it's all sort of uh, uh, tightly coupled to, to our website code or whatever it may be. Things go very wrong from that point of view. And in layered architecture, sometimes it is really difficult to kind of draw out just how important that tier is. I often look at diagrams where I'm kind of going, yeah, okay, so you've, you really talk about that boundary, but you've gone and stuck it in the wrong place in the, in the diagram because it's sort of difficult to fit into the diagram and therefore, in a sense, into people's architectural thinking. So the reason I'm coming onto this is I want to introduce an idea that's been around since 2005. Actually, it's been around for longer than that, but it kind of, in this terminology, kind of came together in 2005 with a gentleman called 
Alistair Coburn, who was really looking very much at this whole area and thinking about that boundary around the middle tier and decided simply to redraw uh, the, the architectural diagram. And he came up with a notion called hexagonal architecture. Why am I talking about hexagonal architecture? Well, because I want to talk about microservices, because I want to relate that to integration, and because in the microservices world, which I will come on to discuss very briefly in a few minutes, because in that world, the, the muse, as it were, the architectural uh, basis for that um, uh, repeatedly uh, is stated to be hexagonal architecture. The microservices world um, has really picked up on this idea, and uh, I want to, to use that, therefore, into a hook, as a hook into uh, various things um, within this presentation. So he redrew his diagram as hexagon. Now, we'll come back to why hexagon in just a moment. Don't get caught up over the fact he's got six sides on it. That is irrelevant to the number of edges. What's important is that there are edges, not how many of them there actually are. So it means you've got a slight problem with the name, but that's okay. I'm sure we can all cope with that. And in terms of the architectural representation, he saw the hexagon in the center as being our application domain, where the business logic lives, and then a sort of surrounding aspect of this, which is where we guard access to the business logic. It is really that boundary around the middle tier that I was discussing. And then he started to introduce terms, and he came up with the idea of using terms which are already very relevant. Um, in 2005, many of us, uh, some of us in the room, were already very busy using uh, certain technology from Microsoft, using the same terms here, ports and adapters, ports and adapters. So the idea here is that in that sort of blue layer around everything, there are um, adapters, adapter code. I don't necessarily mean BizTalk adapters or any specific component type. I simply mean logic that deals with adaptation and mediation between the outside and the inside of hexagonal architecture. And um, uh, he also saw this, or came up with this notion of grouping these adapter, adapters together into a notion of ports, typically because the adapters that live in a port have some common semantics uh, with regards to what they represent. So maybe they represent various customer channels uh, into your organization. So you kind of group them together in that way as you see fit. So he um, essentially elaborated that boundary um, around the middle. I um, have looked at this. Uh, uh, I, I won't bring up some of the diagrams that we've, uh, we've been drawing over the last uh, few years in, in Solisoft, but we, we tended to do this just in sort of round disks and things like that. Um, but um, uh, I looked at this and I thought, this makes sense. This, this makes a lot of sense to me as an integration guy. This I understand as an architectural approach or a way of understanding architecture, and I can relate this to what I've been doing uh, very strongly for many, many years. But here it is coming up um, in terms of microservices, and so we need to talk about microservices and why they're important uh, to, to this architectural discussion. So to do that, and I will get to microservices in a minute, but to do that, I want to talk firstly just about some of the obvious, we've been talking about it for the last uh, day and a half, the, the, some of the obvious changes which are going on in this world of integration. I am an EAI dinosaur. I've been doing it for years and years and years, but the world of integration is changing, and either we evolve and move on with the changes happening right the way across industry, right the way across uh, the marketplace, or else, obviously, we, uh, we atrophy or whatever. So what are driving some of these changes to, to the world of integration? Well, one thing is the increasing standardization of interfaces. We're all very used, to those of us who've been doing EAI for, for many years, we're used to, obviously, the advent of SOAP interfaces and their use um, uh, at the enterprise level. And um, uh, SOAP is, is a great technology. I won't hear anything uh, different about it. I'm certainly not going to get into one of those REST versus SOAP arguments or anything like that. SOAP is a great technology. It's really helped on the integration side behind the firewall over the years um, to, to make things much easier from an integration point of view. And back in 2004, when I really properly got underway using BizTalk, very few uh, third-party um, applications provided uh, a web, in, a web service interface, and if they did, they were normally rubbish. 
Um, but these days, actually, you know, you wouldn't actually invest or buy in a serious application of any kind at the enterprise level unless it had a good story to tell about, um, you know, some kind of web service interface. And generally speaking, that's been a SOAP-based um, approach. I'm not going to go into SOAP um, more detail on the uh, slide than I'll go into. But, of course, the other side of this, and like I say, I absolutely refuse to get into one of these... Uh, uh, awful sort of arguments about soap versus rest, but the other aspect of this, of course, is the the huge growth in um, in restful approaches, or at least approaches which are claimed to be restful. And I can get as uh, you know sort of uh, uptight as anybody else about whether something is true rest or not. But um, this this notion of restful interfaces, which are becoming and have become so important at the cloud level, at the wider level in terms of the services that people are offering. Um, uh, to, to other organizations which do not um, reside behind the corporate firewall. And of course, typically uh, with REST, RESTfulness is a, a pattern that can be applied in all kinds of ways, but typically with REST, we're talking about that limited set of verbs that HTTP um, defines and uh, uh, using that and using state representation and uh, hyperlinks, uh, link approach if you're using it properly. So. Restfulness has really made um, a, a change uh, at, at a level beyond the firewall. I suspect it's going to really start to make a huge change behind the firewall as well as time goes on. But of course, today, one of the things that's driving changes to integration is the enormous growth in terms of services and software, of, of, of uh, cloud-based services that are designed for consumption from the ground up. They're actually designed to be integrated with. Oh dear, oh dear, that leaves me uh, with, uh, with less to do maybe, but, but they're designed for this purpose. That's the whole point of them. And uh, we're seeing you know, a huge growth in terms of, of cloud-based services. And as that process carries on, so the drive increases uh, to actually integrate with those to make use of those, which is why demos on, a, uh, on a, an event like this all start off with the obvious sort of simple stuff like Twitter and Dropbox. And of course, behind that, you know, Salesforce obviously been around for a long time, but all kinds of other um, uh, much more uh, extensive and functional cloud-based services, which are becoming more and more part of our world in terms of integration. Another thing which is driving this, of course, mobile services. I'm not going to say too much about that. We've been living in a mobile world for a, a very long time, and we need to support mobility in all its various guises and all the way that, ways that that's used. And the Internet of Things, which um, shows great promise um, and is beginning, I think, to, to really have a, a wider um, a effect in terms of the kind of work that we're uh, doing and, uh, and so on, and a lot of beginning to really fall into place around that. And this enablement of, of devices of all types to share information, to act as sources of information, which we then need to collect and store and manage and pump around from here to there. And, uh, deal with in all kinds of different ways. And the integration obviously has a role to play um, in this. And because of this, we've seen since 2011, since Gartner came up with the term, we, we've seen a real um, emphasis on what Gartner called IPaaS, integration, integration platform as a service, cloud-based integration services that we can exploit, and which just by virtue of buying into that whole cloud thing become uh, you know, the new, new thing kind of thing, but a, 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 an obvious place to start to deal with IoT and, and, and SaaS integration, but also with hybrid connections and on Azure and, and, and equivalent um, uh, approaches, also being able to really integrate behind the firewall with, with on-premises systems. So iPaaS has really kind of played a role there, and uh, you know, typical iPaaS um, uh, um, uh, technology provides us with connectors and mediation and workflow um, facilities. It's elastic because it's in the cloud, there's no capital expenditure, uh, it's direct cost models, and uh, you know, browser-based tools that you can, you can use. And these are sort of common themes around integration platforms as a service. So, moving on from there, the kind of aspirations that iPaaS begins to address, partly, are the kind of aspirations which the development community has right the way across the board these days, and indeed um, uh, companies behind those. The, the drive for greater simplicity in terms of, of addressing complex requirements, making complex things easier to do. Being able to speed up the rate of development, 
uh, and increase velocity. Being able to evolve um, what we are building much more rapidly and much more easily, really picking up on both the past bullet points, being able to evolve those much uh, more rapidly. My favorite word, democratization, which again fits in with, with all of these bullet points, really ensuring that instead of high priests of, and fill in the gap here, I would say BizTalk um, or whatever, you know, I could name half a dozen other products of a similar ilk or whatever, but instead of those high priests of that specific very specialist technology that is very, you know, sort of focused in terms of what it does, you can start to open this up to a much wider group of developers and maybe even business users being able to exploit and use what's on offer, democratizing the technology that we're offering on the cloud and obviously reducing costs. So, a last, microservices. Microservices is a, a, an idea that really flourished from um, little over a year ago, really, um, and since it's been around for a lot longer. But last year, it was very much a buzzword and uh, a huge amount of, of interest being taken in this after a seminal paper um, from uh, a couple of Thought, ThoughtWorks guys, Martin Fowler and, uh, and James Lewis. And um, it's uh, essentially, um, as I say, uh, based very consciously on the notions of hexagonal architecture and it's this idea of taking your application domain and really concentrating on ensuring that what you, the way you implement services within that domain are very fine-grained and also really comply with a number of other um, uh, sort of aspects or approaches, which I'll, I'll list on the next slide. So I've put that into hexagonal architecture. I've put it into the middle of that hexagon in the middle of an integration space where we're integrating with all kinds of different things because I want to relate microservices to integration. So microservices principles are based on the notion that the services that we've tended to build within the middle tier have tended to be monolithic, which I find rather rude because uh, I'm thinking, hey, hang on a minute, you know, I've, I've been building decoupled services and all that kind of stuff for a long time. Thank you very much. Um, no monolithism here. Monolith is that a word? Um, anyway, no monolithicity, I don't know, um, here in terms of what we're doing. But in fact, the microservices guy would say, no, uh, we see too much of, of chunky services which cover many, many different concerns and really become very problematic in a number of different ways in which we, uh, we manage them. So the idea is to decompose those monoliths into finer grain services. Essentially, this is the new, new fine grain sower approach but um, for a modern audience kind of thing. One could cate ca categorize microservices in, in that kind of way. Decomposing those monoliths into very fine-grained services, where the services concentrate, it's not so much about the size or the, the, uh, the line of, of, of code counts or whatever uh, it may be. It's much more to do with services that do one thing and do it well. And that's what we really kind of concentrate on, doing one thing and doing it well. So. Um, that's great. Um, the next principle is very much about organizing those microservices around business capabilities. So this all comes back to something called Conway's Law. Um, that's basically the idea that when people, well, I'll apply it in a specific way, when people build code, they tend to collaborate and build code that reflects the communication approaches used within their organization. And that's why um, we end up typically with um, traditional layered architecture where, um, you know, you've got one group of people concentrating on um, a website because that's of interest to one part of the organization and other stuff because that's of interest to the other or whatever, and then we have to sort of glue it up. And, and basically what Microsoft is saying, no, we should take cuts through the communication throughout our organization from back to front. And the way in which our code communicates should reflect that, which is much more reflecting specific business capabilities from front end to back end rather than horizontally along the layers. So really thinking through that kind of way. It's the same thinking that leads to multidisciplinary teams where you ensure that your team is including people from the business and people from operations and all of that kind 
understand stuff from front to end and thinking in that vertical way rather than that horizontal way. So organize um, the way in which you design and, and implement services around business capabilities. Make sure you can host and deploy those services independently of each other so that they become much easier to version and evolve over time because you effectively um, uh, ensure that they have a real independence from each other, well decoupled, fine-grained, concentrating on just one thing and able to be hosted wherever that is appropriate in whatever runtime or platform is actually required. And using lightweight communication, which is just, um, uh, speak really in practical terms for favor rest over soap, um, in essence, but lightweight communication. Keep it simple, keep it focused on, on, on uh, the communication that needs to happen with those services. And uh, so then it starts saying no containers required, something I disagree with, but uh, this is meant to be a microservices principle, so I've mentioned it there. And the last one is avoid centralized governance and management. In other words, make sure that uh, if you're a development team, that you can use microservices sensibly, regardless of where they come from, who wrote them, or what platform they reside on, um, and ensure that what you're writing is very shareable um, with other people, so that you're not concentrating on heavy-duty governance of this centralized estate, but much more on the rapid reuse of an ecosystem and uh, what is actually out there. So, so these are microservice principles, and I'm sure that you can begin to really um, see why microservices was a term that was being mentioned so much around app service um, towards the end of last year, beginning of this year, and uh, why you know, we're sort of picky up on that kind of term. Okay, I'm um, not really going to make too much of this. There are problems with microservices. This um, is just, I, I um, don't know whether to keep this slide in. I haven't really got time for it. But uh, it's a great blog site I came across where a guy was talking about how he turned up, pitched up to a team that had been having problems with the microservice way to find that they had this ridiculous approach. They'd actually used Java uh, virtual machines as, as this kind of, uh, yeah, the, uh, the JRE as a kind of virtual container environment. And they'd ended up with just a huge, huge numbers of instances of Java running over large numbers of boxes um, because they'd broken things up in, in inappropriate ways. And so he rationalized, brought things together, ran a number of stuff in, in you know, number, they had one service per instance of, of the Java runtime, effectively. So he kind of just sorted that all out and rationalized it, and got things working very, very much faster with a much smaller number of virtual machines. I wish I had time to go through that. Fantastic. But it's just saying that just because microservices is a new buzzword does not mean that we should leave our brains at the door and forget everything that we know about the complexities of building distributed and highly scalable systems. On the contrary, um, the good news is that building those kind of systems is going to get much, much easier as time goes by. Now, BizTalk and microservices. What? BizTalk and microservices? Surely not. Well, I'm going to make the argument that um, uh, BizTalk is not a microservices platform, but it does share some of the principles with its ports, doing its mediation, effectively there at the outer boundary of hexagonal architecture, uh, and we're used in BizTalk land to adapters and pipelines. It's very sophisticated functionality, really designed for enterprise-level use, and uh, works very well, and it absolutely follows, although it predates the hexagonal, not only the architecture, but even the terminology. And then behind that, and behind a, uh, uh, the message box, which is an asynchronous layer, we've of course got the orchestration engine, which is not a microservices engine, but we build these, these services and we host them, not particularly independently, because they have a heavy duty dependency on the engine that we provide, and they're not very shareable and reusable, because they're buried behind the message box, so we breaking microservices principles in many ways with BizTalk, but nevertheless, in terms of hexagonal architecture and some aspects of what microservices are going to, I just want to make that plea that, you know, not all of these ideas are absolutely brand new, and uh, some of them, you know, we've been practicing as best we can for, for, for many years. So that's great. What about iPads? Well, most iPads offerings today, I've got a problem with. I'm going to say quite bluntly, I've got a real problem with most of the iPads um, uh, offerings today. Sorry to be so critical. I hope I'm not standing on anyone's uh, toes too much with that. But my problem comes from, from this. This is what a typical iPads platform looks like. It's some kind of 
cloud-based container in which you emit and contain your code at runtime. And your code contains connectors and it contains um, uh, mediation and transformation uh, components. And, and generally speaking, the entire service is dressed up as some kind of workflow. And you wrap it all up and you emit it as one package into the cloud service where it's all um, sorted out for you. And then it runs as a service up there in the cloud. And obviously, that service may be replicated and may be elastic and all of that kind of stuff, all that kind of goodness. Um, but what are my problems with it? Well, my problems is this is monolithic. Uh, this makes no proper separation of concerns. This is actually worse than the BizTalk story um, because well, the BizTalk story is a very good story, I would just like to say, but this is a step back because this is taking lots of different concerns and sticking them in one great big um, mass of stuff which you then emit as a single service into the cloud. And architecturally, I don't think that works very well. I've just being controversial here. You're allowed to disagree, of course. But I don't think that, that's, um, that is quite the right way to go, to be perfectly frank. And uh, the other thing is that we're still back, of course, to highly proprietary approaches. You're tied in to a particular vendor's technology, and that's what you live with, and that's what you uh, deal with. So I have some real problems with, um, with today's iPaaS offerings. Um, here's one. Um, it comes from a company called Microsoft. It's called Mabs, uh, where they've got a container. Um, and they, into that, you emit your, uh, your connectors and your, your pipelines and you know, all that kind of stuff that goes into them. You package it all up and you emit it into the cloud. And it's all wonderful stuff, of course, because it comes from Microsoft. It just has no problems at all. It's absolutely perfect and fantastic. And, um, and, and there we go, They're a, a real iPaaS thing. However, um, when I saw app services, I thought, aha, right, OK, this starts to make a little bit of sense. Because we still have a container. It's called a resource group. That's an important thing. I do not believe in getting rid of containers. They're really important. They provide all kinds of useful services to us. But we also have a gateway that we can uh, use that Microsoft provisioned for us, which uh, handles uh, the interaction from the outside world to the inside and will become the place where things are metered and all kinds of goodness like that. And inside our container, yes, we have all kinds of mixes of stuff. But the point is now that this technology focuses on an ecosystem. These microservices are not emitted, well, they may be grouped together in the way that you want to as a single package, but the concentration here is on the widest possible ecosystem of different services um, implemented by different teams and completely different technologies, whatever they want to use, um, but bringing it, to, bringing it to bear, bringing it to the marketplace ultimately in a way that you can readily consume within a single consumer, so you, with a single container in ways that make sense to you um, and without that sort of tie into the one vendor's technology and the one um, approach for all of that kind of stuff. So it's that concentration on the ecosystem and it's that separation, in, in fact, of, of workflow. One of the things that uh, is important about app services is that all of those microservices that we might have within the app service world are independent to the workflow engine that Microsoft have created. You don't have to use the workflow engine. And indeed, um, you can go online, you can go to the Windows Store and download the alpha, if it's presumably still there, of something called Project Sienna, which is about business users being able to ultimately will be about business users being able to exploit some of these microservices that we emit onto the platform and keeping those separate from um, uh, uh, being able to sorry, exploit those uh, uh, in the way that business users wish to, uh, to do that. So that's great. And so we've got this application gateway at the, the boundary there dealing with uh, all that it's dealing with. Uh, for time, I won't go through this in, in great detail because I've just got a few minutes and I'd like to get through a few more slides. Um, but um, the gateway is something important to understand and uh, its importance within app services and it will become increasingly important as the technology evolves. And moving on from there then, so that's great. So we've actually kind of broken some of those problems. We've got an iPaaS, but we've actually, or Microsoft have actually tackled some of those fundamental issues uh, with that. Now, I'm aware of time, and I'd like just to go through a few more slides before, um, uh, before I uh, get to the end of there. So moving on quickly, I just wanted to say a few things for two or three minutes, and that's all I can allow myself, around containership. 
because I do think um, contains one of those words that in the, in the Microsoft world, the .NET world, we never seem to really emphasize, whereas really emphasized in other worlds. And of course, containership is a very difficult thing to talk about because what a person means by the term container can be very different depending on who you're talking to. There are all kinds of different forms of containership. Today on Azure, obvious examples of containership are PaaS roles, uh, web roles and worker roles, and app service, which is basically the next evolution of website and mobile uh, service technology with web apps, mobile apps, API apps, logic apps, etc., and the BizTalk stuff. Oh, and of course, I should just mention another container uh, model that's, uh, that's there as well, an iPads uh, container model, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. Coming down the line, uh, announced publicly um, a few days ago, Windows Server containers. Nothing to do with app service specifically. It'd be interesting to see what tie-up um, starts to really happen over time. But this is containership built into the Windows operating system at the kernel level. Um, and uh, so as well as just normal Windows processors, we can build containers around Windows processors and uh, make use of those. And this almost feels like virtualization, like virtual machines, um, but uh, is in fact a, a way of packaging up our code and deploying it from environment to environment um, very, very simply and easily and packing these together, high density if we wish to, on, on single machines. And then the, the um, extra Hyper-V containership, which is also announced, which is really building a much more security around uh, our Windows process as it's contained within those containers. And then the other part of this, Microsoft made huge announcements over many months about Docker. I'm sure many people in the room will be aware of Docker. And uh, this will all kind of integrate with the, um, uh, the behind-the-scenes plumbing that Microsoft are producing around this. All of this Microsoft has gone public with uh, just in the last few days. What is Docker? If you don't know, Docker, uh, I'll try and give you a very brief idea here. Docker is a way of exploiting an operating system kernel um, and uh, with an engine on there. Basically, the idea is that you can go to a... Um, uh, repository, uh, you can uh, down, download, drag down uh, all the user mode files for um, an operating system that sits on top of that kernel. Currently today is Linux, but in future it'll be Windows as well. So you grab um, sort of basically uh, something that looks like Windows, maybe Windows Now, which has also been announced, that base image. But the point is, as developers, that's just a line in a script file to do all of that, literally. Uh, the rest of this is that you build up and build up and build up uh, your application, snapshotting or whatever. The final layer on top of this is your application code. So all you have to ship is basically your application code and enough metadata to say, and this is the final bit to sit on top of all of this um, stuff. At the kernel level, everything is very isolated and very split up and contained in that way, jailed. And so you can start to ship your code, especially services, very rapidly, very simply, just a few megabytes uh, to uh, transport around the place, stick that into a virtual machine or a physical machine as you see fit, and build up high density of these containerized uh, services and deploying those very rapidly. It's all to do with DevOps. It's all to do with rapid, continuous uh, deployments and allowing developers to really package up their code in a way that just travels with that code, really reducing the issues of, of taking code from environment to environment and making it simple enough for even developers to use with just simple scripts, he says. Oh, I'm so rude. So running out of time, so I'm not going to go through Docker and, and all of its kind of stuff, wonderful animations here um, and uh, whatever. Docker is very platform independent. Um, I'm mentioning Docker because, um, uh, you know, this is, you can go and read about it today. What we're seeing with Docker will be one way effectively exploiting the same technology that Microsoft are using for um, their Windows service containers, server containers. And um, obviously, if this was in a few weeks' time, a few months' time, I'd probably be talking a lot more about Windows Server containers, which will feature. But for Windows Server containers, think of a similar story to the Docker story, but more plumbing and more sophistication behind, behind there, which you can access and make use of. That's, that's really, I think, the, the way to think about this, with fantastic platform independence with Docker on top of that. So we have a real evolving landscape. And um, I just have a few slides I want to finish off in my last four minutes. Um, so a uh, real evolving um, landscape out there on the cl cloud of which Azure is playing a really leading role. And Windows and Microsoft platforms, they're playing an increasingly leading role. We're going to see more and more of that over, over the months. 
But be aware of all of this, because this is your future as developers, thinking containers, thinking cloud services. And one aspect of that is app services that we've been talking about today, and with that, obviously, the integration story. So I want to just finish off with just relating this back then to microservice integration in hexagonal architecture, and just to make sure that we all understand that what we're talking about is not that one container to rule them all approach that we've perhaps had with um, the big enterprise. And please believe me, those big meaty enterprise applications, uh, um, uh, integration server products like BizTalk still play a very valuable role. There are many, many problems that you could not do any other way that practically than using that kind of technology. You know, working with a customer at present, it's also 20-year-old green screen Unix applications and FTP, and they've got to do master data management and integrate with new stuff and all that kind of thing. Whoa, you know, for that you need you need BizTalk. Um, so, but we're moving away in this in this microservices world from that one container to rule them all, uh, all a kind of approach to a much more um, distributed and freer approach of, of reusable uh, microservices, uh, using those um, to connect onto premises. And obviously, we've had uh, talks about connectivity back on-prem from whatever you're running in the cloud. But up in the cloud, um, using those, those microservices, I've got more builds in just a moment, aware of time here, uh, but using those microservices intelligently. This does mean a bit of a sacrifice. This is what BizTalk looks like in terms of the concerns that it offers just at that boundary around hexagonal architecture. And um, there's an awful lot of concerns which are addressed there. They're not necessarily all going to be replicated with um, a connector in, in app service. Um, they're all out of the box there just with ports in, in BizTalk. So be aware that obviously um, you can expect a, a simpler model, but there is a cost uh, involved in that in terms of functionality. But broadly speaking then, we're talking about uh, mediation services, which architecturally live in that boundary. We're talking um, about the ability to connect that up on-prem. We're talking about um, workflow, uh, well, fully decoupled uh, business logic, which we then um, host, as it were, in the center of our hexagonal architecture, and hosting these as microservices on the app service platform and making use of that. We need to think architecturally. We need to understand where things live within hexagonal architecture. And doing that and picking up on what Microsoft are building around those concepts we have a really firm and strong platform on which to do a lot of the democratized integration and the building of engagement with our customers and our trading partners and our staff and all of that kind of goodness which people are really wanting to, uh, to do. Um, we've got platform service orchestration. We've got um, the ability to route by any means, which on Azure is all kinds of different ways, including the service bus and uh, via various data storage uh, approaches or whatever. We've got platform level monitoring and tracking provided to us through the container ship uh, and, and platform models that Microsoft provide, which is absolutely brilliant. And we favor horizontal scaling and we're technology agnostic. And that has got to be good, look for the ecosystem. And that is my last slide, sir, apart from this one, which is just saying thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>